Hello everyone, welcome back. So as I mentioned at the end of the last video, this is something I wanted to show and discuss because I missed my opportunity to show it in the game. There is a cutscene that plays when you collect 15 of the legendary uh, memories for the rune carver. And it's supposed to be an insight in, as to uh, something that happened in the past and well, the implications in this are quite interesting. So I pulled this up from Wowhead's YouTube channel um, so that I can be able to show it to you guys since I can't seem to be able to, you know, find out where to replay it in the game. So besides, this gives me the opportunity to pause and discuss it for, you know, because there's, a, you know, a couple things here I do want to discuss. So let's take a listen. Dancing on strings. I will not break. I will not break. I will not fool. Your mind is already broken. But even a broken thing can be made to serve. Countless secrets extracted. Insidious designs forged into weapons for my armies. Okay. Obviously huge implications here, okay? So, let's go back. Pathetic. A puppet dancing on strings. I will not break. I will. This is further evidence that one this happened some time ago. In fact, this clearly happened a long time ago. Uh, but I will say this also raises some questions timeline-wise, this cutscene. Um, but this further leads to like cementing the belief and the theory that we all have that this rune carver, this is the Primus. We all have been wondering, where's the Primus? What happened to the Primus? This is what happened to him. He was broken and chained. Yeah, I mean, that's further evidence there. But can I just say, I've always found the sound of the jailer's voice to be odd. He seems hard to hear is it just me or is there an effect on his voice that just makes it sound as if he's like i don't know like you guys probably have heard it myself where sometimes i'm back here away from the microphone and it's probably a little hard to hear what i'm saying compared to if i'm up here closer to the mic here it's much easier for you guys to actually hear what i'm saying it's much more clearer it just seems like there's evil, either this kind of muffle over his voice or he's farther back away from the mic or something. I don't know. Is anyone else bothered by the sound of the Jailer's voice where it just sounds odd? It doesn't really sound all that clear or, you know, it just sounds strange to me. Sought to 
that line is strange and interesting. And this is what I mean about how there's some kind of timeline issue with this. Because then he reveals... Frostmourne. And the Lich King's Helm. Now, Blizzard has been very upfront about this ever since BlizzCon last year. When they announced Shadowlands, one of the things they were, I know I recall them like telling us back like during the panels was that they were trying to, you know, do some, a bit of changes to the lore and many of us were like oh gosh they're retconning the lore and you know we were all kind of like going nuts we had very negative reactions and at this point i'm okay with it as long as it makes sense and they're doing something with it like something cool good interesting um and it really depends how much of a retcon it really is or if this is just extra info that was never revealed before um, or that they're implying that this was actually what, what was happening behind the scenes and we just never knew about it. Let me give you an example. The retcons they did in Diablo, those are straight up retcons, you know? Like, the retcon about the warrior from Diablo 1 being Aiden, uh, the, you know, the, you know, the eldest son of Leoric, because remember back in Diablo 1, the kid who... Um, Lazarus took, uh, you know, Leoric's son, the youngest one, and Lazarus took to be the vessel for Diablo in Diablo 1. At the time, in, in the book, or the manual, it said that that was the only son of Leoric. And the warrior was just some random wanderer or adventurer. Wanderer, get it? Because then later on in Diablo 2, it kept going. Which was funny because in the manual, was it the manual? It was either the manual or, or another little short story that was supposed to be kind of a lead up into Diablo 2 where Deckard Cain was say, uh, talking about, you know, the warrior after the events of Diablo 1 after he jammed the Soul Stone, though they didn't know. They didn't notice. There was something strange about him. We didn't know. You know, he seemed, you know, very distant, very quiet. Uh, we never even caught his name. This was like, that's like a thing that he literally says in either the short story or the manual for Diablo 2 where no one knew who he was. He was just some random warrior or adventurer that had helped them and Tristram from Diablo and then he left, you know, because he had the soul stone, he became the dark wanderer. And then in Diablo 3, Blizzard was like, "No, no, no, he's actually Aiden, uh, the eldest son of Leoric." Because then they want to have that thing with Leah and all that, and that was a straight-up retcon, because the stuff before that made no sense, where Decker Kane is like, oh, none of us even called his name, none of us even knew who he was, and it's like, how could you all not know that he's the eldest son of the king, Leoric? How could you not know who that is? Like, that's a straight-up retcon, just straight-up changing it without, like, being like, oh, this was, you know, this is why. Like, not not much of an actual explanation. Like, just, nope, this is the change we're making. And that just kind of, like, is like, oh, okay, well, that doesn't really make sense with that some of that other stuff. Now, there are some extra little intricacies and factors when it comes to Warcraft lore that could make this go, well, that doesn't make sense. But again, if they do this in a way where it's basically them going... No, this is what was actually going on or happening. We just never knew about it or was never revealed before, as opposed to just straight up changing things, you know, just straight up changing things without an actual explanation, you know, um, in terms of like, you know, changing up the writing or something like, I mean, so, some of the stuff they did with Illidan, I could try and say was a retcon because, well, it was literally written wrong in terms of what they did with him in BC. Um, and then you could say, well, the retcon of what he was doing with the Demon Hunters um, during the Black Temple Raid, having them go to Mardoom to get the Sargeric Keystone, that's a retcon, but it's a, 
but I think it's a good retcon because it's not something that changes anything. It's just like, yeah, this is what was actually going on. We just didn't know about it at the time. I think that's, see, in my opinion, that's a decent, good retcon compared to none of us even knew his name. And then you find out, oh, it was the king's son. Wait, how'd you all not know who that was? It's the king's son. You know, he returned home to save his brother and, you know, and all that, you know. So that's just one of my examples there. So going back to what I was what I was talking about here, this causes a number of timeline questions and issues that we have because I've been discussing this with some other people that have seen this cutscene and we're like, you know, those of us who are really into lore, we're discussing this like trying to go, okay, how does this fit timeline-wise? Because if this is when he first gets the design for Frostmourne and the Lich King's helm, how long ago did this cutscene take place? When exactly did this happen, this memory that we're seeing from the Rune Carver? This had to have happened before the events of Warcraft 1. You know, like, the, like lore-wise, the lore of, like, that we used to have involving Ner'zhul and him becoming the original Lich King, that has to do with, like, the lore of, you know, when the Burning Legion was in pursuit of the Draenei, uh, or the Eridar, they became the Draenei, they landed on Draenor and they were making peace with some of the orcs and such like um, our buddies uh, Durotan and Orgrim. They were actually buddies with the Draenei and Velen and such. Um, and then the demonic horde thing happened because then Kil'jaeden showed up and he used a uh, illusion of Ner'zhul's mate uh, in order to kind of get him to do some things. He also, of course, um, had Gul'dan on his side doing things. And then eventually Ner'zhul had it revealed that he, you know, he was tricked and he didn't want to go along. And so then that's when Kil'jaeden chain, you know, used his powerful magic to, uh, ba like basically permanently change Ner'zhul, you know, into, uh, <laughs> the original Lich King, uh, like basically also bounding him to this helm along with creating what I usually referred to as the essence of the Lich King, since that was what was really carried forward to when Arthas put the crown on. The original lore was that the Nathrezim had created the helm uh, on behalf of Kil'jaeden to be able to use this to uh, bound Ner'zhul and the essence of the Lich King into the helm to be able to use the Lich King for their means to create the Scourge, to be able to open up the way for Archimonde and the Legion to invade Azeroth. That was the original lore. And this took place before Warcraft 1. Because that leads to the Demonic Horde going through the Dark Portal and invading Azeroth in Warcraft 1. That's how. That's what the original lore was there. Now, I have done a video showing you guys that book that we can find in Revendreth, which basically implies straight up that the Nathrezim were actually created by Denathrius and were made into like the ultimate infiltrators and manipulators to manipulate and infiltrate all six of the cosmic forces to do things and spy and get information and other things on behalf of Denathrius and the Jailer. So at some point after that, the implication here being is that the Jailer got this, you know, design for Frostmourne and the Helm, probably forced the Rune Carver to create them, and then passed it on to, or rather got in contact with his buddy Denathrius, who then had the Dreadlords, who he was having infiltrate the Burning Legion, have them go to kill Jaden and present him with these claiming they were the ones who created it and to use them to create the Lich King with Ner'zhul. Because the original lore was that the Nathrezim were extremely gifted and strong and talented uh, rune creators and carvers and smiths, that they, could, they were so good at making rune weapons and other very, you know, 
uh, enchanted, you know, pieces of gear like weapons and armor, like the helm, that the Nathrazim were so good at it that they were the ones who actually created Frostmourne and the helm. And then Blizzard told us, no, 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 they didn't actually create it. They found them from some guy that you're going to meet in the Shadowlands, and they brought it to the Legion. That was what Blizz told us at BlizzCon a year ago. So now we get here and we find out it's this rune carver guy because they were also tr letting us know. So this is how you're going to be able to make legendaries. And that's what they told us about the rune carver. And I was like, so they're saying this guy here is the one who created the Lich King's helm and Frostmourne. And I was like, okay, they need to do a bit of expl explanation for this. Because it feels like a retcon. However, if they are now saying that the Nathrazim claimed they had created, but they did that to cover for this because the Nathrazim tried to basically cover up all this stuff that they were working on behalf of Denathrys and the Jailer away from Kill Jaden and the Legion since they were basically infiltrating everything. That, I think, is a clever retcon. Because it's not just straight up changing things. It makes it seem like the Nathrazim were purposely lying about it to cover for this. And the real craftsman, the real rune carver, that they said they were the ones who created the helm and the sword. But it was a lie because the Nathrazim, the Dreadlords, are masters at lying. You know, deception manipulation so they were actually even able to manipulate the likes of kill jaden which is impressive considering we know how good kill jaden is at infiltrating someone's mind within a heartbeat to find out the truth whether or not they're lying to them because this was actually s spelled out in the illidan book uh back in uh warcraft 3 the, the first chapter of the book, where when Kil'jaeden shows up at the Black Temple after Illidan has gone there and has taken down um, Magtheridan to claim the Black Temple for his own so he could hide from the Legion, Kil'jaeden shows up and goes, you fool, you really thought you could hide from me? And he, in the book, it shows how Kil'jaeden in that moment infiltrated Illidan's mind. But Illidan was so, you know, good at, you know, magic and things, these you know, these kinds of things that he actually sealed off a portion of his mind away from Kil'jaeden and hid it from him so that he couldn't find out the truth of what Illidan was trying to do. And basically letting him see things in his mind that he, you know, was okay with letting him see to kind of still pull this off. Now, remember, Illidan absorbed the power of Gul'dan's skull and defeated Tychondrius, which, as we have also seen in the likes of Legion... When a demon hunter defeats a powerful demon, they can absorb their soul to get stronger. And I'm pretty sure that Illidan didn't just, you know, get this power from the Gul'dan skull. He probably also got it from Tychondrius. So it's... I find myself thinking, did Illidan... Now, he was already a really strong, powerful mage on his in his own right before he, you know, got his demonic form. But did he also get some of this extra oomph to his magic and such against Kil'jaeden? Possibly from Tychondrius after he defeated him. It's just a thought I have. Which would continue to play into the idea that even if Kil'jaeden had done that to any of the Dreadlords, that they were that capable, like Illidan, to be able to seal off parts of their mind so that even if Kil'jaeden was able to look into their minds he wouldn't be shielded away from seeing the truth of who their loyalties really were to and, you know... Oh, I'm sorry. It's a, it's a little late. I'm a little tired. Um, just trying to keep get all my thoughts out here. Who they were really loyal to and shielding him away from the knowledge about the Rune Carver and the Shadowlands, which is probably why we haven't seen any demons from the Burning Legion and such um, here in the Shadowlands. Um, even though we've already defeated the Burning Legion, but still, you get my point. At least I hope you do. To me, this actually is a retcon that can actually work and make sense because it seems like they are actually not just straight up changing things, but trying to now add this extra element that actually can make sense 
that we just never knew about. And to me, that's actually a, a, a retcon that I can roll with because they're not just straight up changing things like they did in Diablo. They're actually trying to add more context to it, more background stuff, and perhaps trying to do something with this. Now, I was okay with the original version of it. Uh, on the record, I was f perfectly fine with the lore with how it was done before. However, I actually do kind of like this. I know some people that there are some people that actually don't like this. Um, though I did throw out there, well, maybe we need to find out some more info, which they might reveal later in regards to the likes of Denathrius, because some don't like the idea that Denathrius just created the Dreadlords. Um, I mean, I, I'm somewhat uh, on board with that which is why I'm hoping they will actually reveal more of Denathrius' backstory. I want to know more about Denathrius' backstory if we're going to roll with this idea that he created the Dreadlords to do all this. Now, the stuff with the Dreadlords, I'm actually, you know, okay with because to me it just kind of helps elevate them and what they do, you know? Just the idea that they are these master manipulators, that they even manipulate the likes of Kill Jaden and the Burning Legion to do this, to pull this off with the Helm and Frostmourne that they claimed they lied about them being the ones who actually made it. You know? And then it goes, okay, so based on some of the other stuff we know, this can work in regards to the stuff about the Lich King when Bulwar was like, you know, that there was another presence in the helm, the one that I feel above the to the broken sky above me, implicating that the Jailer was the one, the main dominant presence within the helm, so to speak, somewhat. It, it's not entirely clear, but then again, the stuff about the helm and the essence in the, of the Lich King and such, that's never all been entirely clear, you know, officially anyway. Many of us, it's just been our own either beliefs or theories. So, yeah. I hope that I'm trying to get my points across here relatively clearly. Maybe I've been repeating myself. I apologize if that's the case. But this just is such a monumental revelation right here. That This is like an official revelation right here. It's funny. This was bugged before. When it first people were first reacting to it, the jailer wasn't even in this cutscene. It was just the carver looking around, and then you would see like kind of a texture on the floor of what may have been either the helm or Frostmourne. And it wasn't until later people were like, oh, wait, it was bugged before, and now you can actually see the Jailer and him showing these things where it's like, oh, okay, now it's much more clear to actually see this and comment on this. So, yeah. Um, yeah, pretty big and important cutscene. I had to talk about this. I had to discuss it. So, anyways. Um, I mentioned that we were going to be going after Thrall. I think it may end up being just... You find this one thing to get this clue, and then you have to go turn it in, and then he'll be like, wait until next week when I will actually be able to actually give you something to find where Thrall is. So, that's probably going to end up being the case, in which case, I'm probably just going to skip doing that Torghast run. So, if that's the case, you'll probably end up having to wait until next week for us to continue. So... Or at least I will be waiting until next week to continue. You guys will can you know by the time this gets uploaded, you can just watch the next video or something like that. <laughs> you know, because um, I'm recording these way in advance before you know these actually will get uploaded. This is part 56 now, and I think at the time I'm recording this, I've only uploaded like part 11. <laughs> so just to give you an idea of how far in advance I'm recording these, just trying to record these. You know when I have time for my job, but also it just shows you how much into all this I am. And this is while also working on one other character. I haven't even gotten to two of my other characters for the Kyrian and Night Fate Covenant stuff. So yeah, that's the cutscene revealing you know the memory of uh, the Jailer having you know basically extracting from the Rune Carver to make Frostmourne and the Helm of Domination to make the Lich King and such. So, anyways, stay tuned.